They said that Brian Colangelo was going to be the anti-Sam Hickey. He would be available to the public, available to the media. But since he sucked so bad so far in Philadelphia, it seems like he doesn't want to answer any questions. Kyle Gaffner and Dave Rosinski are both here. We're going to talk about this strange and weird Markel Fultz situation, and we're going to talk about Colangelo's press conference from last Friday, his second of the season, only his second. Amazing. Like you said before, dude, he was trying to do everything opposite of Hinky, but it seems like he's following in his footsteps almost. The guy is almost a recluse, a hermit. He's nowhere to be found. He spews all this bull crap about what's going on with Markel Fultz, what's going on with the Sixers. He, he's just a miser. He's a rat-faced miser, and I cannot stand that guy. I hate him. It's crap. Brian Colangelo. I know Dave is chopping at the bit right now. Brian Colangelo got a personalized message from Dave Brzezinski. Wake the fuck up. We're not stupid. We've been through this for two years. You got on your second news conference of the entire year, again, supposed to be the anti hanky and you got the nerve. You got the gall to stand up there for 22 minutes and not talk about Fultz. You want to talk this trade deadline that you didn't do anything at. I'm not going to knock it for not doing anything. But why would you want to get up there and talk about doing nothing? And it's not even like we, we're doing good. You know, the Sixers, they're on pace with their wins. They're going to be fine. But it's not about this year. We didn't tank three years to get to the first round of playoffs and lose again, like, which is probably the case this year. Marco Fultz is a key addition to the future. We gave up two lottery picks for the guy. And this is the strangest story in the history of sports. The only explanation that's been logical up to this point is the Monstar theory that this dude's talent has been poached. So for you to get up there and walk out of a press conference 22 minutes in, this is probably top 10 most egregious acts a Philadelphia coach has ever done in the history of pressers. And this is coming from a town that dealt with Andy Reid for 15 years. All right. So right off the jump, I'm going to show you guys something. I got a tweet from Zach Rosenblatt. Uh, he's a Sixers reporter for NJ.com. And he's got – a tweet of Markel Fultz actually shooting outside the paint. So what, what uh, Colangelo was talking about during his presser was that he actually didn't have that range. And, uh, well, according to this tweet, he, he does. So we're going to look at this right now. So here we go. That's his old form. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looks nice and fluid. And, if you, and we've all seen the videos beforehand. It looks like he had a little hitch in his shot prior to this coming out, being released, like he almost forgot how to shoot or he was hesitating or whatever. So this is a positive feedback to see something like this. See, this is absolutely positive, and I love to see this. But at the end of the day, I still disagree with them letting him shoot in front of people, in front of cameras. Although the Sixers haven't came out and admitted it, it's at this point, it's, this is clearly a mental thing. And for him to be shooting in front of people on cameras can't be good for the kid. I just, I don't know why they continue to, to throw him out there like that when so far he has not reacted well to all this negativity. Do you think it's probably to put the fan base at ease, to be like, to feed into all the stuff he's been releasing into the media, being like, okay, here, there is some progress going on with Markel Fultz. Maybe it, you know, to feed into maybe if it's mental or it is physical with that shoulder. I know we've they come out and said he's using VR goggles to simulate real game time to see if that would help with his shooting. If it's what is it, the shoulder the dekinesis? What is it called? I, whatever the freak <laughs> like thing. Scapular kinitis. It's not a scapular imbalance. I guess that's been wrong the entire time. Um, it's a completely different condition. Again, kind of like a phantom condition that no player in the history of the NBA has ever had. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I can't really get into all that, but it's weird, man. It's, it's certainly, this is going to be something that, and that 30, 30, that comes out about these, the Sixers process. This, this will be certainly a large piece of that now. Definitely be a headliner. I think all I know is I'll, I'll never forget that day in September. I don't know if it was before the preseason, when the first initial critique of his shot, I forget even who the report was that tweeted out. They were in a gym shooting in Camden. And it was very – he was doing foul shots. It was such a minimal difference to his shot. And everyone was freaking out about it. And I'm over here just saying, 
calm down. Why, why are people making a big deal out of this? And I wonder if even that initial people starting to make a big deal out of it then got into his head right from the get-go saying, oh shit, this could be bad. Because never in a million years did I think that initial tweet from that reporter was going to lead to this six-month saga of absolute confusion. Yeah, we know nothing. Absolutely nothing. We're, we're in the dark here. Uh, Kyle Newbeck of, of Philly Voice actually just, uh, if you want to read the whole thing, it's, it's a novel, literally. It's like a thousand pages it's long. Basically, um, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire basketball <laughs> version. Yeah. <laughs> give the guy, that was a hell of an article, though. He, that was, give that guy props. He did a lot of research, took a lot of time. It was good. Very well put together. Yeah, so shout out to Kyle Newbeck of the Philly Voice. Uh, put together that, you know, great. I, I, I might even uh, put it in the description box below. But uh, so you read into this thing. And, and honestly, after reading the article, I, I was actually more confused than I was when I began reading it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the main point to takeaways was the fact that just last month, um, Markel was having workouts with Keith Williams, longtime trainer, family friend. Helped him along his entire career. Basically helped him get him where he is today. But something tells me him and the Sixers have definitely had the beef. Also in the article, it talks about how he went on Carl and Reese in October on WIP. <laughs> the day Brett Brown made some comment about Fultz and literally said the exact opposite. But the fact that he, this, he's having workouts with this guy, unbeknownst to the Sixers, and reporters know about them before the Sixers do. And that is never a good situation to be in. Obviously, there's a rift between Agent Fultz, this Williams guy, the Sixers. They are not on the same page, and it is not a promising sign to see. No, and you want to get everybody on the same page because if he's in his corner, he's going to be influencing Markel Fultz. You know, he could kind of pin him against the Sixers and not maybe not want to stay here long term because you want to have this guy, whatever he may be doing, and he trusts this guy because he hasn't had his father in his life, and this is kind of like his – father figure I feel and he's been with him you know through DeMatha all the way up through Washington made him the number one prospect what have you but it, it, it just seems so petty from this guy to do that is he the one that altered his shot or was it the Sixers because from his side he's saying it's all the Sixers doing and then vice versa they're saying this is Keith Williams we had talked earlier saying they were working out in in uh, Jersey in that Jersey gym doing shots. I don't think there was any uh, cameras there though, right? Is that what that article said? I don't believe there was any yeah. cameras there. No cameras. No. No cameras. Um, you, you know, and you just want to keep him out of limelight. But, and then he comes out with these cryptic tweets saying you can't trust anybody, be it if it's the Sixers. And is that guy getting into Markel's false ear, chirping away, you know, starting a rift. It's, it's kind of it's worrisome. And the, the, the most other alarming thing, tweet. Yeah, go, go ahead, Dave. The most alarming tweet was the one after there was a nationally televised game, either ESPN, TNT, I forget, um, with the analysts basically said that he talked to Brett Brown and Brett Brown told this analyst that it was a mental problem as well. Um, and this analyst goes and says that. And then he got Fultz firing off a tweet, literally anti-Brett Brown, against his head coach, rather than approach the coach like a man instead of tweeting out to the entire world. He basically said, fuck Brett Brown. He didn't say it word for word, but he said, can't trust no one. Obviously referring to Brett Brown. Mm -hmm. And you know why, I, at the end of the day, I, I am now pretty positive, is my opinion, that Keith Williams changed his shot and this wasn't the Sixers. There's only person in the Sixers organization that I've trusted over these past five years. It's Brett Brown. Mm -hmm. That guy doesn't lie. He's a straight shooter. He's actually, he's gotten in trouble from the organization for being too honest. Too honest, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's true. And you could tell in his voice he's frustrated. Like the, the one quote asking, when, when's Fultz, what does Fultz need to do to get back on the court? Brett Brown. <laughs> the guy needs to be able to shoot a basketball. Guy's very candid, very honest. So I, I fully believe the Sixers on this one in that this shot change happened on Fultz's time with Fultz's people. Mm -hmm. All right, speaking of his shot, so another thing that he's been tweeting out, he's been retweeting his old shot. Uh, this was back maybe, what, a month ago he was doing this? So I'm sharing his screen again to show you guys if it plays. So he's just retweeting this, and this is his old form. This is showing him in the summer. 
Uh, just launching threes obviously looks a lot smoother than that little shot put shot. So what, what's all this about with, with the retweets? This I guy think- needs better people in his camp. <laughs> he needs to get off social media. He just needs to completely go like what LeBron James does playoff time. Cold turkey, get off everything. Because every little thing he says at this point now, it just it hurts him more. It's just childish to do stuff like this. Go on social media, put out tweets about bashing your organization that drafted you, and then trying to reassure and give confidence to people that, oh, I'm okay. Like, my shot is here. I can get back to this form. And I just feel like if you're a man, then you shouldn't have to be putting this out there or going to, like you said, Dave, go up to Brett Brown and talk to him man-to-man instead of being like a little baby or a child and tweeting stuff out like this. It's just – Makes me worry that in the long run, is he going to be able to, to mentally handle this? Because what if he has a bad year after that? Is he going to get in his own head and not think he's going to be able to play in the NBA? And it just could be worse off than that. It, it's, it's a bad situation for us. It's, it's freaky that this guy has had this weird things, never happened to anybody ever. It's like, how do you forget to shoot? You, you don't. You don't forget to shoot. It's like riding a bike, man. So that's where Brian Clanger comes in and starts lying to the fan base, and we're expected to believe this. I mean, we're Philadelphia is not a stupid fan base. We know what's going on. At what point do you start to hold, at least semi-hold like Simmons and Embiid accountable for, and even J.J. Redick, who basically freaked on the reporter for videoing him, why don't they mentor this guy and say, look, man, especially Embiid and Simmons, we've been here. We've been through this. And, and look at this right now. You can make it through this, but this is how you have to handle things. You can't be tweeting stuff out like an idiot. Clearly, this guy doesn't have very good people in his camp. Keith Williams, while well, he helped him get where he is today, for him to go on WIP and start talking shit on the Sixers, not a good move. His agent, Raymond Brothers, who hasn't said a word since – he said that Fultz got his shoulder drained when he actually got a quarter zone shot. Yeah. Complete opposite procedure. Uh, thank God at least he shut up from the public eye, but clearly Raymond Brothers isn't, isn't the sharpest tool in the shed. So at what point did, does Embiid and Simmons need to sit this guy down and be like, look, man, listen to us. We've been here. We're having success now. This is what you need to do to, to survive in this town and in this league, for, for that matter. Because look, at, it's not this town. Okafer left, and look at him in Brooklyn. He's not doing good there. No. It's, it's a man's league, and you gotta act like a man. I don't care if he's 19. 19, number one overall pick in the draft. Like, get it together, dude. Being 19 is not an excuse. This is what you it know? takes when you're stay, the top. Stay in now. college another couple of years, you know? Stay in college if you're not ready. That's something that Embiid was, was talking about, actually, is uh, the people in his camp and, and how he needs to change the people within his camp. It seems like he has trust issues, to tell you the truth. And I know they move J.J. Reddick's uh, locker right next to Markel to maybe help mentor him with his shot and maybe kind of show him the ropes on how you handle things. And I hope that that can possibly help him later on down the road. But, right, I just think Markel has trust issues, to tell you the truth. I don't know what happened on with his personal life or with his dad or what have you. don't know if that's really rectified and, and – helped him later or affected him later on in life but it just seems like he's really close with his obviously his mother and his trainer and everybody else is on the outside looking in all right and this uh, city's been very we've been very fair to him up to this point we've had the distraction of the eagles again simmons and Bede are exceeding all expectations the sixers are winning right now they're exactly where they need to be no one's really been attacking Fultz so much as We've attacked Colangelo and the Sixers for, again, mishandling yet another situation, deja vu all over again. So Fultz has had a fair. We've given him time. and we can, You go on to most of his mentions on his Twitter, a lot of positivity from the fans. The season's been done a great job. But at some point, the patience will run out. Yeah. yeah. And he better be ready for that because it will come at some point. And if he's not going to show any progression or anything, he thinks this is bad. How is he going to be able to handle the fan base getting on him then? Yeah. All right. So we're going to move on just uh, real quick. We're going to talk about the, the season so far, the first half of the season, but uh, in particular, 13 and six since January. How about this team? TJ McConnell with a triple double the other night. I mean, give him the MVP. He should be an all-star. They say Ben's getting gypped. 
Ben and TJ both should have been replacements, but there's been now three injuries. Yeah. Like the whole I mean, The Ben thing is a complete crime, but the TJ, it, it's insane. Sam Hankey. I, I love how Hankey gets these guys undrafted out of Pittsburgh. Did you guys see that picture tweeted on, on the internet floating around of what TJ McConnell looked like when he was in ninth grade? No. Nah. You look at that guy and how is this guy in the NBA when he looked like that 10 years ago? It's insane. <laughs> I haven't seen that picture, but he embodies the city. He's heart. He's true great. He comes out with energy. Even when we're up 25, this guy's diving on the floor, head first into the stands, throwing his body around. He's giving it his all every minute of the second of, of every quarter. I, I love it. I think he's a perfect floor general back up to Ben Simmons. He plays well with Ben Simmons. Uh, when you need him to score, he comes up with big shots. And for him to get his first triple double, especially at home, I, I thought was great. And against the Knickerbockers. Um, well-deserved. Uh, you know, I still think we have to add a little more pieces to the bench, but he is definitely a solid piece. And remember when he first was on this team and the process started, everybody hated T.J. McConnell. They said he didn't deserve to be in the NBA. He was a joke. He was too slow. He was this. He was that. And I want to see where they're at now because he's improved his game in every facet year in and year out. Um, and he just gives us all. He's just Philly through and through. Yeah. Yeah. So w- thoughts on, uh, I, I guess, well, you kind of answered it already. I mean, Ben Simmons should be an all-star. It, it was a joke. I mean, it, at first it was Goran Dragic, then it was Kemba Walker. I mean, come on. I think it's because it's the same reason. I mean, Embiid last year, I know he didn't play enough yeah, minutes. It's, it's but he's a day. rookie. They want to give the veterans the benefit of the doubt. I get that. But, but he's not really even a rookie. Like, he's been in the league now two years. Yeah. This redshirt thing, I'm telling you. <laughs> Like, if, if Fultz comes back next year and doesn't play and he, he comes back strong, it's, teams are going to pick up this whole redshirt deal. But, yeah, it's clearly the NBA making a statement that they don't want rookies playing in the All-Star game. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do? Unless they're I'm like actually, LeBron James or somebody like that. Unless he's completely tearing it off the, you know, the minutes every night, dunking it. But he's, I don't think he's putting the numbers they expected. It, it's all about ratings. we got to remember that, too. And it, they are giving it the benefit of the doubts to the uh, veterans. and. It's a shame because he's what put up six triple uh, triple doubles so far, tied Magic. Yeah. And did you see once once TJ got that triple double the other night? Big thing that went viral on the internet was I think six absolute stars in the NBA like Paul George, I forget all but big big name guys that don't have any triple doubles yet this year. And TJ yeah. McConnell's got one. And Ben Simmons has six. And six, six triple doubles. Uh, <laughs> It's like a popularity contest, too, because if you look now, Donovan Mitchell is in the running get rookie of the year, and Ben Simmons is now in second. And it's like, really? Because why? it all has to do with him averaging more points. I truly believe that. Even though Ben kills him in every other category, it's except for the scoring. And I think that's a bunch of bullshit, too. I think the fact that he can't really shoot has yeah. something to do with it. But today, I, I, I actually made this realization for the first time ever. Ben Simmons is 6'11", 240 pounds. Anyone else that size in the NBA, you're a power forward. And if you don't shoot, no one blinks an eye. Yeah. But because he is arguably, the, in my opinion, he might be the best ball handler in the NBA. But you like, when, he, when he moves, it's like he's running without a ball even. It's, the ball is a second nature. So because he has those skills and he's technically a point guard and a 6'11 body, people give him a little bit more crap for not being able to shoot. But I'll also say that it's, his drive now, not making this all-star game. All the people saying he can't shoot, he can't shoot. It's going to be Casey, Jason Kelsey. No, it's not going to go catch. It's, you're going to see a speech. <laughs> ben Simmons can't shoot. Next year, you're going to see Ben Simmons shooting with that right hand. And he's going to be shooting. He's going to be popping off threes. He's going to be shooting foul shots. So that's going to be the only thing he does all offseason. You know what? The, this situation with, with Ben Simmons and the shooting reminds me of, or actually makes me think about, makes me think about LeBron James. Because they always talk about him like, well, he doesn't go to the tin enough. He settles for too many jumpers. Well, then you got a guy like Ben Simmons who doesn't like to shoot. He, he likes to go to the tin at will, and he can get to the tin at will. So it's like, it's like hypocritical to say that about Ben, but then to say about LeBron, stop taking jump shots. Other thing with LeBron, too, is from his rookie year in the NBA up until probably 10 years in, every offseason he, he added a different aspect to his game. Yeah. Whether it was the post-up move, being another shooter, rebound, like every year he found something to do in the offseason to improve an aspect of his game. 
And I, I love the fact that Ben Simmons and, and LeBron are buddy, buddy. Yeah. At the end of the day, like the attitude, LeBron a little shaky at times, but to have Ben Sim- to have LeBron in your corner like that and, and met, kind of mentoring you, that's, that's a pretty good thing to happen for the Sixers. I, I, like I hope that he rubs off to have that because LeBron's got that killer instinct to be able to take over a game and then be passive if he needs to. And I hope that he does rub off on Ben Simmons that way because LeBron even came out and said, this kid could be better than me when it's all said and done. If he puts in the time and the work, which could be a very good possibility. I mean, it just, so I give, I'm, and Adrian knows this, I hate LeBron, but the guy owns his craft. He's the best out there right now. I mean, the guy's amazing, and he has worked on his game every facet. Like you said, post game, whether it's passing, shooting, he's just worked on each part of his game year in and year out, and he's just – he's the best. And I hope that Ben can do that same thing. And if you saw that shot Ben hit last night, looks like that shot's really starting to come along too, that 15-footer he nailed. I'll tell you what, it's very promising, similar to Embiid last year, how literally every single game, and sometimes from half to half, you could see actual evidence of improvement. Mm -hmm. Ben Simmons, you've seen evidence of improvement Mm -hmm. as the year goes on, more confidence. No game ever goes by without the highlights. You scroll through Instagram during a Sixers game, all you see is oops, and like, we're in the new Lob City, and we don't even have Nerlens Noel anymore. Like yep. he's, he's more confident every game. He's starting to sink his free throws. He's starting, he's starting to hit jump shots a little bit more. Again, I don't think the shooting is going to go on a real high trajectory at least this season, but looking forward to next season, I think you can definitely see some major improvements in that. And, right. and I hope well, go ahead. Oh, well, I'm just saying I actually have to cut this short because apparently uh, this, is, this is the first time I've used Zoom where they're making you pay to upgrade. So uh, we have less than a minute, guys. Oh, you're pulling a Brian Colangelo on us. Look at yeah, that. The, they, 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 the Sixers know that, that we're on to them. So they're <laughs> making us cut this short. That's what's going on. So, so <laughs> if we go out, it's because this – yeah. So, actually, we have to cut this off. So, Kyle Gaffner, Dave Rosinski, I'm Adrian Fedcu. Uh, we have to leave, unfortunately. See you.